May they become the order. We're delighted this morning to be at Borough Hall, and of course, uh, the Borough President of Brooklyn is here. Uh, we would like for him to have an opportunity to welcome the members uh, to the great borough of Brooklyn. Uh, those of you that uh, reside in our city, you know the name. Uh, you don't have to introduce them in any way. All you have to do is just go someplace and say, Marty, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And of course, welcome to what I now call the Republic of Brooklyn. Uh, actually, my name is Marty Towns, Mark. <laughs> I think your, your colleagues should know that, uh, that in, for us in public service here in Brooklyn, uh, we always should be related to Ed, I have to tell you that, because he's truly the gold standard in our vote. So uh, thank you, Ed, Congressman, very, very much. And certainly, I also want to welcome Deputy Mayor Edward Schuyler. Uh, many people say he bears an unhappy resemblance to me, I have to tell you. And let me say, if I was his height, I'd definitely be his weight. Am I right, Deputy <laughs> Mayor? Also, New York City Controller Bill Thompson, Timothy Gilchrist, Governor Madison, Senior Advisor on Construction and Transportation, uh, Dr. Edison Jackson, it was great seeing you here as well, Colin Granham, uh, President of the Bedford Stuyvesant and Restoration Corporation, Dave Robinson, Associate Director of the Center for Information, Technology, Policy, at Princeton University. Uh, I can't think of a better person than Ed, uh, Congressman Ed Towns, the Chair of the House Committee, an oversight and government reform. And I think we can all agree that this is one of the most important jobs in Congress at this moment. In this day and age, when every dollar counts, don't we know that? We need someone like Congressman Towns to make sure that the government spends our money wisely along with your colleagues. And if there's one thing we can all agree on regarding the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, it is that the, this money uh, that needs to be spent now to give our community a jump start, no doubt about it, but it also needs to be spent well so that we can get our economy back on the right track once and for all and make sure that every penny allocated is used for its daily purpose. Times, but we can at least rest assured, in my opinion, of course, that after long, eight long years of uh, George W. Bush, we finally have in the White House a president who understands that our nation and cities are the engines of economic development of our nation. And we're fortunate that President Obama has someone in Congress like Congressman Towns to make sure that fiscal responsibility occurs in our federal spending process. So now, Congressman Ed Towns, thank you for inviting me and your fellow congressional members on the committee. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming us to Borough Hall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Today's hearing is the first in a series of field hearings that will be held in various locations throughout the country. The purpose of these hearings are to examine the crucial role that the state and local governments will play in the administration of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, also known as the Stimulus Program or the Recovery Act. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 is an historic piece of legislation which I was proud to be one of the nine co-sponsors of the legislation. The Stimulus Program has already been and will continue to be a powerful force for getting the American economy back on track. As we face the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression, I'm especially proud to be here today in my district, in my home borough of Brooklyn, New York, is the financial capital, of course, New York is the financial capital of the world. It is home to millions of decent, hardworking, and dedicated people from all backgrounds who stand ready to help turn the American economy in the right direction. I'm also happy to have my friend and colleague from the state of California, the ranking member, Congressman Issa, here with me today to get a look at how we do things in the borough of Brooklyn and be able to talk with people from the borough of Brooklyn. Just a few weeks ago, several hundred residents of Brooklyn attended a town hall meeting on a Saturday morning that Congresswoman Yvette Clark and I held to talk about President Obama's stimulus program. That is a simple but telling example of the commitment the American people have to overcome the economic challenges that we all face together. And I emphasize the word together. New York is a unique source of strength for America, and I know it will play a unique role in putting our economy back on the right track. In Washington, this committee has been working hard 
to make certain that federal agencies do everything possible to protect your hard-earned tax dollars and see to it that they are spent wisely. Every dollar that we can stop from being wasted is a dollar that is put to good use on a school improvement project for our children, a job training program for those who want to work but need new skills, or a construction project that results in something as simple but important as a safer road or cleaner drinking water. For the Recovery Act to be effective, the federal, state, and local governments must coordinate, cooperate, and communicate, as President Obama stated recently. This plan cannot and will not be an excuse for waste and abuse. The three, to fight fraud, the Recovery Act provides for an unprecedented degree of oversight and accountability. For example, the Recovery Act established the Recovery, Accountability, and Transparency Board, known as the Recovery Act Board. Some people refer to it as RAT. <laughs> Which is designed to provide transparency on how federal recovery money is spent. The Act also included significant increases in funding for the offices of Inspector General, whose job is to root out waste, fraud, and abuse in federal programs. I applaud President Obama for his support of these measures, but I must admit that I have concerns, and let me tell you why. I'm concerned that a very heavy burden is being placed on state auditors, who are responsible for monitoring and accounting for the stimulus funds they receive. This concern was raised at the committee's hearing last month, and it needs to be addressed. Accordingly, I plan to introduce legislation that will provide increased funding for state auditors so they will be able to meet the demands placed on them by the Recovery Act. With individual states receiving billions in stimulus funding, it makes sense that the states also be fully equipped to closely monitor those taxpayer dollars. Not initially providing funds for state auditors under the Recovery Act was an omission, omission that should be rectified as soon as possible. I'm also concerned that states have already started spending funds from the Recovery Act, but they have not yet been given complete guidance from the federal government in terms of how the money is to be tracked and how they are required to report spending of stimulus funds. Further, I have major concerns about the administration's primary transparency tool, recovery.gov. The fact of the matter is that recovery.gov is currently not usable. It's not a usable database where citizens can go to see how their money is being spent. I expressed this concern to the chairman of the Recovery Act Board when we, he testified before this committee in Washington last month. It is my hope that he takes the concerns of Congress to heart and transforms recovery.gov into a comprehensive, useful, and easy to understand database that will bring about true transparency. If he fails in this regard, you can be certain that the members of this committee will exercise their full oversight authority to ensure that he honors his commitment. Today we will hear from people who have been and will continue to be at the front forefront of the effort to ensure that the Recovery Act is administered in an efficient and fair manner at the state and local level. We want to learn more from our witnesses about how the federal government is doing so far in administering the stimulus program. Where and how can the federal government do better? In short, we want to ensure that the federal government is doing everything it can to help state and local governments successfully administer the stimulus program. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing here today, and I look forward to hearing their testimony. I will now yield to our ranking member, Mr. Darrell Issa from the great state of California for his opening statement, the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it truly is a pleasure to be here in, in the great borough of Brooklyn. Uh, I'm also, as you know, joined by Dennis Kucinich. We're fellow Clevelanders, so we've, uh, we've had sort of a, a passing knowledge of things that come out of this part of the world. Uh, long before I went to California or to Washington. I want everyone to understand that one of the reasons that this makes today so special is that this committee is supposed to be about waste, fraud, and abuse, and it's supposed to work in a bipartisan fashion. Under your leadership, it's very clear
here is doing just that. For a uh, majority, uh, for a chairman, uh, obviously the majority, and of the party of the president to, to start shedding light on failures that we made in Congress in writing uh, this stimulus bill of $787 billion, failures, oversights, things which we were not consulted in advance, but in fact, now after the fact, Chairman Towns and this committee are seeking to make sure that we can rectify. As the chairman so uh, rightly mentioned, there was no funding in order to do oversight by the states in this legislation. And I join with the chairman uh, in making sure that we do find a, uh, a way, either with existing funds or with new funds, to provide that material to the states. Additionally, nothing in this uh, legislation provided accountability below the first recipient, meaning when Albany received the funds, much of which we'll be talking about today, they could distribute it, meeting their requirement. But we had no way of, of guaranteeing transparency below that, so that if they were not doing their job to ensure that once the check was written, uh, it was used properly, there was no uh, oversight. We're going to work together on a bipartisan basis to change that. Additionally, as you will undoubtedly hear repeatedly today, there's a little bait and switch that goes on between the time the money leaves Washington and the time that it doesn't seem to arrive at your hospitals and other areas of need here in the borough. That's understandable. Both my state of California, which had a $45 billion deficit at one point, and a slightly smaller deficit here in New York were partially wiped out by the stimulus funding, meaning they didn't apply the money that we sent in Washington to additional projects, but rather simply pull back their dollars, push forward, uh, federal dollars, and as a result, where you thought you were getting more, at best, you may be getting what you originally were promised or less. As we all know, we have lost millions of jobs, and the stimulus package, at best, if used properly, is estimated to save about three and a half million jobs. If we allow the moving around of dollars in a way that diminishes the intent, we obviously will diminish the outcome. We cannot afford to have one of those three and a half million jobs that we hope to save lost. And clearly today we will hear that that is happening. The president, in fact, has made this one of the hallmarks of his administration early on. He did so with good intent, and I joined him in a belief that we needed something which was timely, targeted, and temporary. But as we have begun to see, the targets are often poorly defined, the temporary uh, at some states who have pushed back on funding is questionable because of little nuances put into the bill that are affecting the ability of states and localities to use the money on a temporary basis and in some cases require a program be begun which will only be funded for 18 months and thereafter would fall to your communities. So Chairman, I'm deeply concerned about the waste that uh, will come if cities which were already stretched to the limit find themselves, when the money runs out, forced to continue with programs that may or may not suit uh, their uh, particular municipal area. Here in Brooklyn, you are an older city, so new construction and many of those items is not nearly as important as repair and reconstruction. One size does not fit all. I'm hoping today that uh, our working on a bipartisan basis, the solidarity that this committee under your leadership has begun to have will show and show to the people here that this committee will not allow this fine city to be shortchanged between the time the money leaves Washington and the time it was supposed to arrive here. With that, I look forward to all the testimony and give back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Thank you for your uh, statement. Uh, at this time, one of the hardest working members of the United States Congress, a gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Dennis Kucinich, who yielded him for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, um, my colleagues on the committee and uh, people broke. I'm here to support my chairman and also because I understand the concerns that Brooklyn has related to the concerns of people all over the country. Now. Are we going to see an economic recovery? What will that recovery look like? Will it provide more jobs? Will we rebuild America's infrastructure? All across this country, there are people who are worried about losing their home, 
homes, their jobs, their health care, their retirement security, their investments. And this committee has the responsibility of being the watchdog to make sure that all federal programs find the way through to the beneficiaries for whom they're intended. And when you're talking about trillions of dollars, money coming from the recovery program, money in the troubled accident relief program, uh, we know that any time you're talking about spending on that level, it is inevitable that there's going to be problems with the way the money is distributed and problems with how it's spent. Your fortune in Brooklyn that your congressman Ed Towns has ascended to be the chairman of the oversight subcommittee, of the oversight committee, because this committee has the ability to be able to make sure that we hold all of those who are trusted with these funds to the highest level of accountability. And the only way that can truly be done is to make sure that you have people representing you who have the kind of experience that you can see if something looks like it's, it's going on, it's not right. And because of Ed Town's experience in rising to Congress from this borough, you can be sure that his eyes and his ears are going to be essential in making sure that these programs find a way to help the people from their intended. And also, if there's any misconduct involved, uh, that will be brought to the public's attention. Let's go back to where we are as a nation. The Obama administration understands that this American Recovery Act is only a first step. A hundred million dollars out of the initial uh, 787 billion will go towards infrastructure improvement. And yet, Mr. Chairman, the American Institute of Architects said there's over two trillion dollars in infrastructure needs to rebuild our bridges, water systems, sewer systems, rebuild our roads, schools, hospitals. America needs to be rebuilt. We need to get millions of people back to work doing that. And, but we will not have the confidence of members of Congress to be able to vote for more programs unless we can prove that these programs that are being set up are going to be operating in a way where there's integrity and where there is a commitment to making sure that the programs that we say that we wanted money for, that's what's happened, and that they're done in a way that's honest and efficient. I'm a person who believes that government can work, but it only works if you have people watching to make sure it works. And so that's what this committee is about. And I'm proud to be here with my chairman and with the ranking member ISA, uh, Congressman Platts, and Congressman Welch, so that we can hear from the people of Brooklyn about what your dreams and hopes and expectations are and what you're concerned about. And we can take the information back to Washington and share it with our colleagues. This is a great community, and I'm glad to be here at this moment to be part of this hearing. And I look forward to hearing your testimony. And thanks again, Mr. Downs, for giving us the opportunity to come to Brooklyn so that we can hear from your constituents uh, whose concerns express the concerns of all Americans. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind of words as well. I'd also like to recognize the person that I had an opportunity to serve as the ranking member when he was chair of the subcommittee, and uh, who I had enjoyed working with. He's very fair, and he said that if you give you an opportunity to give me input, I do expect your output. So I want you to know that I enjoy working with you with that, and with that arrangement. I want you to know the deal is still on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, great to be with you, Ranking Member Issa, and my colleagues. Um, first, it's, it's wonderful to be back in the city of New York and in the borough of Brooklyn. Uh, I know we've uh, held hearings here for a while in the past, as well as schools all close by and uh, just a wonderful opportunity to, to visit a great city. Um, I, I want to add my, my words of thanks um, to my, with my colleagues, to you for holding this important oversight hearing. Uh, one of the most important responsibilities
as we move forward with the Medicaid transportation program, in order to meet the federal requirements and meet the timeframe, we are creating a process that will end the original program that we created with the state Department of Transportation or the Metropolitan Transportation Authority that could not be funded because it's a cost overrun over the last several years. So we
probably focus on you, but it's just questions for both of you. Uh, you know, I happen to be a child of a child of a successful uh, My grandfather worked in WCA projects because for a uh, person who was in the South Texas, it was going to work on my team to have some of those jobs. And he uh, and left behind the legacy of things that actually were built during that time that my grandmother and my mom had told me about. It. And even those films that went to the museum were the pieces that he had worked on. So I appreciate that there was a model in the Great Depression of federal money used to keep people employed and to keep their skills and keep their work ethic. Um, I mean, it's just not a measurable item. I, I'm sure there are figures of how many people were employed under the BCA or the program, but it left a legacy. It summarizes on the West Coast when I drove from Seattle on summer vacation. Go inspect the film soundtrack with the Netties and the Coast. The drive down the coast part, I don't know if it's real, that's the bridge, that's the bridge, 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 the if you move federal dollars into things that you can fund under our rules, and then you move dollars elsewhere, that you pretty much collect is what you say when you can use, say, 14,000 jobs, or in fact, that money really went somewhere else and it created 6,000 jobs. It isn't that an accounting matter that would really give us a fair assessment, and in a sense, it wouldn't you almost say just the number of, you know, economic for a million is what we're going to create, because you're in a position where the numbers you report are where you've used our money, but not necessarily where you've used the money that is freed up for other projects which may or may not be made in the country. Uh, I agree with uh, your objective that this is a very good one to get out of the topic. Uh, on the construction side, it is by far the simplest thing to do because you do it all the time with the process. Thank you. 
or potentially a new fund. So we can look at the fact that federal government and the states and uh, major cities were able to update the reporting system, the automation, the computer, and the ongoing oversight. The whole system is only federal funds and receives them every year. If we can get a portion of this money allowed to be reallocated for new funds, then I realize we don't have to put it in the committee, so that we can use the same opportunity. Wouldn't one of the best legacies for your job be to really, really make a modern leap in the ability to account and report the funding that we all do in the same Then, 
where the money is, when it's being transferred, reimbursing that kind of stuff, all the marketing money is sitting on it, waiting to find a program where the people around the country are waiting to go. So if you can give us any of that, we can get a lot of people to do that. And that's what we're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. 
doctrine and social safety net. And in those cases, it was improved the conditions in the community, particularly the physical conditions. And I, I speak a little bit about that in the testimony. Um, I think what's next for um, despite that significant benefit, is whether our residents are seeing like their society saying, residents who are low scared and chronically unemployed will be directly receive employment opportunities as a result of this And then the second consideration would be whether uh, the minority and women on business will directly receive business opportunities as a result of this. And I don't want to uh, be the serious concerns, and I don't want to downplay that benefit uh, because they are real. Uh, for example, uh, in the first I said, the status of, um, as I mentioned, because of the substantial number of people who are uh, living in poverty or who are working poor, and in that poverty, there are a certain number of people who are working poor, um, the fact that we're going to have extended unemployment insurance benefits, um, the social security one-time payment, the enhanced insurance benefits, and the low, lower payroll taxes are all going to have a significant positive impact for residents in the local businesses. Um, that's clear. Um, I think in addition to that, I mean, the city of New York, um, I think, uh, I'm in favor of what the city of New York would have really known that the least portion of it, which is a too important to use the lion's share for civil youth employment. Because I think this summer, um, they have many people working and applying skills, being able to supplement the household income, that's going to be very important. important. Of course, that was a given also in part because these folks have to be spent in two years. Um, and of course, then, um, there's going to be substantially more workforce development funds available to assist residents. Uh, particularly in the black community area. Particularly in the black community area. Um, other benefits as it relates to the physical conditions in the community, for example, one of the parts is being funded by the city of New York, uh, one of the transportation projects, is the improvement of the commercial corridor in the uh, in central Brooklyn. And I'm hoping to um, where the honor's office is here previously located. Um, and that's going to result in new sidewalks, new signage, new street furnishings, new trees. This is important for that particular corridor because the will assist the local businesses in creating a safe and attractive environment that will facilitate the uh, improvement of their business operations. Another area that there is going to be some concrete benefits that will assist local income residents is in health. Is that what you're Well, let me use this as well. Well, I think the answer is that it's a good thing. Well, that was a good thought because I don't think I have five minutes with the tour. Um, but let me just say, the concerns have to be, you know, two years from the obviously, it's reasonable or it's reasonably the intended purpose, which is to jump start the economy. So, the concern is that I say this and I prefer about how to spend funds in two years, but we have to be trying to think about using existing contractual relationships. We frequently go into small and minority owned businesses. And the difficulty is trying to figure out processes that are appropriate for quickly. And the other thing is the prevailing wage requirement, which in itself is also relatively reasonable when you look at it on a space, but again, that has the possibility of limiting the incorporation of, of low skilled workers. So I know I'm speaking to you, but maybe we'll get to some questions. Thank you. Thank you.
that will by the very nature of the two other chapters of the Bible are the best of the Under my watch, you look at the report of this Christ, and you'll be able to test the how, why, what you can do. There are the top thousands of things that can test the truth. But if you're not going to do all of these things,
to make available for the federal implementation, particularly at your level, are two percent, maybe about fifteen billion dollars. To work in that implementation, standards and modernization equipment, so that either through your own engines or, as Mr. Robinson said, through competition within the search engine community. This information is used for it through every day, but also be poured through by the public to pay their taxes. Would that be a fair investment? Would it be a fair bill? Any of them? Uh, where the population statistics, population of 
It's quite possible that we're already for person in this country who do not use the internet. Now, if you're talking about specific going back, it's most likely, and I'm just guessing at this, but it's most likely that people who don't use the internet happen to be in neighborhoods where there's a lot of poverty, social disorganization, and such things they can't afford either the internet connection or they can't afford the, um, uh, the, the terminal, whatever. How do, how do we make sure that people still know about these programs? Because if you're not going to try to use the to survive, how, how do you get the information? That is not only the same group, but it's a message you use there and you want to get the case study. I would say that uh, the analogy I'm going to use is computers in the class, which I think is sometimes in some sort of process in Maryland. Obviously, one computer in every class is accessible to people. And we thought at the time, you know, there was just one, and we saw all the students using 30 students using one computer. And that was true, but what turned out to happen was the teacher would use the computer to get new lesson plans and other new information. How do you get to it? No computer can get to it. And then for the rest of us, we say, what I would say about the internet is that many of them, if the information about what is available to this event is being sent itself public instead of being buried in some file somewhere, that means that people who are engaged in the work of public and risk of those communities, people like Mr. Beckham and his colleagues and others around the country, are better able to assist their communities in need, even if the people they are helping are not our not. It's still the case that the other day was to do it. Thank you. Here's where I'm getting at, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, conclude with this. With all this money being available, it seems to me we should be able to have a people to knock on doors and tell people about programs that are going to be able to do it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask you 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 to ask